dude, sometimes I'm just thinking, but then I start thinking about the fact that I'm thinking, and then I'm thinking about thinking, and I'm like, but like, what am I actually thinking about? Because I'm thinking, but I'm thinking about thinking, so is it still thinking, or is it like double thinking? I don't know, man. I think you may just be overthinking it. Welcome to The Two Retired Homeschoolers, a podcast about books and other interesting things. I'm Holly, and this is Rebecca, and my life lesson is that sometimes it can help manage your emotions and thought loops when you give them names. So that's why I named my anger rage, and my sadness melancholy, and my joy happiness. What about you, Rebecca? I don't know. I I can't think of anything. Oh my gosh, it's working! Today's book is Can't Stop Thinking by Nancy Collier. Can't Stop Thinking is a self-help book by an overthinking psychotherapist with overthinking patients whose lives she magically made better with the lessons in this book. Basically, can't stop thinking? Well, you need to stop thinking. Seriously, stop. Your life will be so much better. first impressions are that I read this as an audiobook because it was the only format available to me and the narrator was a robot lady (laughs) and it was horrific you know we read this book in the first place for my sake and I can totally see you getting back at me with making us read a book on statistics or mind cloth or something so hang on a second are you accusing me of being interested in Hitler's biography (laughs) Are you saying that's, like, my go-to choice of book? Well, not for, like, crazy reasons, just because, you know. Yeah, I thought you were the one who was fascinated by the way villains think. Okay, so, first impressions. I was walking through the library, and I was so sick of just, like, getting from point A to point B all the time. I was like, you know what, I should actually explore this library because it's a library, and that's great. And I was looking through it, and I found that book on a shelf on a little stand, and I was like... I would love to stop thinking about the fact that I hate college so much. (laughs) And it, like, helped. And I was like, you know what? I should read, like, the whole book sometime. And so, what do you know? Like, a year later, I finally remembered it and decided to pick it up again around the time that we started this podcast. So that's why we're reviewing it. Mm -hmm. That's why we're reviewing it. It has nothing to do with me. Everything (laughs) to do with Holly. Okay, so our next section is Holly's main takeaways. The first point is that thinking can be an addiction. And each of these uh, five points we're going to bring up are things that Nancy talks about in the book. Okay, so she starts out by listing the requirements for what makes an addiction according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. I think I had to read the prologue of that when I took a psychology class once. But anyway, um, so the requirements were... and, And just imagine instead of something like smoking or drugs, we're substituting the word thinking in for it. So, does thinking sometimes negatively impact my overall well-being? Has thinking created problems in my relationships? Have work or home responsibilities been neglected because of thinking? When I notice that I haven't been thinking, do I experience fear or anxiety or a sudden excess of thinking? Do I find myself thinking more and spending longer stretches of time thinking? And I could go through this whole list, but these are the sort of things that, like, if I think if you have like the majority of it or, or so many of them, then it qualifies for being an addiction. So she was basically bringing up this idea that thinking can be an addiction if you were to apply these laws. And I was like, you know, that's really interesting. And by those standards, probably most people have a thinking addiction, which she also talked about. So yeah, what did you think about that? I feel like I'm using the word thinking so much. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're hyper conscious of it. Yeah. yeah I thought it was like, okay, that's interesting, and that seems to go along with how a lot of people seem to function. I definitely have no problem turning off my thinking, (laughs) so it doesn't... I don't know, I felt like this whole book just didn't apply to me. Yeah, I kind of felt that way too. I mostly made this go on the podcast because I wanted to read it, and I knew I wouldn't have the time if we were reading another book, (laughs) and I was like, you know, I feel like Rebecca isn't going to get a lot out of this, mostly because... Okay, you think about the three pillars of health, like mental, spiritual, and physical, and 
I think most like everyone has something they're more naturally bent towards being healthy in and more naturally like it's a struggle for them. And I feel like you are like one, it's like probably the most unusual to be naturally mentally healthy. And I feel like you're one of those rare people. I can only think of like a few other people. But for you, it's not so much of a struggle to be what physically healthy. You definitely work really hard on your physical health. Yeah. It's, it's not hard for me to be subconscious of eating right and exercising. Yeah. So anyway, Holly thinks she's a genius. Okay. So yeah, basically I learned something about myself as I read this book and I didn't know it, but basically I think I'm a genius because I started like analyzing more and thinking what I was thinking about more and realizing that every time I would like think about a solution to a problem or just be thinking about a problem, I would like take the most random thought and like dive into it and really try to dissect it and be like, where did this thought come from? Like what happens if I live this out and blah, blah, blah. And like, oh my goodness, it's so crazy. Like, I feel like I can almost outsmart myself by pretending I'm a lot more dumb. (laughs) (laughs) And also like your thoughts lie to you a lot, which I know, but it's still just everything feels so true. And a lot of this stuff she was saying about thinking just in general, I found applied to me, even though it felt so bizarre, especially when she said stuff like, our thoughts are actually like really crazy. And if you were to write them down, you would realize this. And one time I was in a really bad mood and I was trying to figure out why. And so I do this a lot, actually. I I think it's a great practice. I like wrote out what I was thinking to make myself feel that way. And after I wrote it out, I was like, that is the most ridiculous thing. Like it was something like I was trying to break a bad habit and I kept feeling horrible about the fact that I was trying to break it. And I was like, why the heck is this happening? So I wrote out what I was thinking And it was something along the lines of like, Holly, you always try to do this and you're always failing and you should just like accept that this is the way you are already. (laughs) And I was like, wow, that's so unhealthy. (laughs) Which in my brain, it it sounded so logical. Like, why do you keep doing this to yourself? (laughs) And I was like, yeah, I'm certainly not going to break this bad habit if I keep thinking like that. Also, I found that even though your brain is constantly always going into overdrive and thinking too much. Like that's what it feels like it's there to do. So it's constantly doing it. Your brain is also actually quite lazy because it doesn't really like thinking about things of substance, which I also think doesn't really apply to you. I feel like this is why school is a difficult thing is because you're actually exerting yourself and your brain in order to like comprehend concepts or like apply knowledge or whatever. And so your brain actually kind of hates being put to work in the same way that some people don't like exercising and putting their <laughs> body to work. <laughs> pointed. <laughs> yeah. But also my brain is like really smart and it loves to like consume junk food while pretending it's vegetables. So while I'm thinking all this crap, I feel like I'm like, again, thinking up stuff that's really good and like I should be diving into. But really it's like, it's just junk food. <laughs> I mean, I agree that my brain is lazy and that you'll think but your brain isn't though like in the same way it's easier for me to exercise I feel like it's easier for you to dive into stuff I do like to dive into stuff with my brain because I know from past experience that it feels great Mm -hmm. to like be immersed in something and just learn it thoroughly however there's still like a bump in the road to get over to actually get to that point kind of and so my brain will just be like do I actually want to like dive into this and get over this bump no i'll just think about something easier yeah so i totally do that i think that everyone's brain probably does unless you're like sir isaac newton or something (laughs) or just unless you're a self-disciplined person yeah i wish i was and i'm working on being more of one well and i don't feel like it's necessarily a bad thing i feel like your brain could also just be like I'm looking at cabinets right now. Hmm, maybe I should start calculating the dimensions of those cabinets and what I would do differently and blah, blah, blah. (laughs) Which my brain does do that sometimes. Like, I just... (laughs) I know it does! (laughs) (laughs) And try to figure out how it works, even though I could just look at it. Yeah. And just take it without having to be like, okay, I see that there's gears here. What do these gears actually do, you know? (laughs) But I think think it's okay for your brain to rest, but you you don't want to be like, giving your brain junk food to chew on so it feels like it's being smart when it's not and then also you don't want to always be shoving vegetables down its throat like you can let it 
not eat all the time. Yes. <laughs> so I th- yeah, I think you should let your brain rest, but you should also make it work when it's time for it to work. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's hard to do, and it's definitely a habit, whether you do it or not. Because I know a few people who genuinely use their brains and, like, they actually think about stuff. And most people don't. Most people just kind of use their brains as much as they need to to get by. Yeah. And the people who use their brains, they generally don't use it all the time. It's it's easier for them to also switch it off when they're just enjoying themselves, which I feel like is much healthier. I aspire to be one of those people. <laughs> it's kind of crazy to me how many people, like now that I'm reading this book and I was one of those people, don't think about what they think about more. Because we understand with the concept of physical health, you have to put work into keeping yourself healthy. You have to eat healthy, drink enough water, go to sleep, and you have to put like boundaries in place and all the, and you have to do all these things in order to stay healthy in this area of your life. And we do the same with our spiritual health, depending on what religion you are, like with Christianity, reading the Bible, praying, going to church. We understand these concepts, but when it comes to mental health, it's like no one thinks about the fact that they need to think about what they're thinking about. (laughs) Okay, lesson three. Uh, what you resist persists. I actually had a person once tell me I was going through a kind of a hard time and they were like, well, just stop thinking. And I was like, okay, I agree with the basic assumption that if you were to stop thinking about a problem, it wouldn't be so bad of a problem. If you slow down or or try to stop thinking about a particular problem in your life that is either out of your control or further thinking about it literally does no good. It's going to make it less of a problem. But it's like, well, how do you do that? Because if you don't have any self-control and you're not in the habit of controlling your thoughts, it can literally feel impossible. And so that's what I found this book mostly useful for is finding like tactics and tools in order to like start better habits. Um, But one of those was basically stop fighting the, like you're thinking, like stop trying to stop thinking, which I found, More like be aware that it's merely thinking Mm -hmm. rather than trying to shut it down. Just withdraw from it a little so that you're observing it instead of being stuck in it. Yeah. And, And stop thinking of your thinking is so important. Okay, so I really like this quote. Thoughts themselves are not inherently problematic. What's problematic is our belief that thoughts require being thought about. Mm hmm So it's not so much a matter of I need to stop thinking about this now because I'm overthinking it. It's more of a Okay, I'm not going to tell myself to stop thinking about it. I'm just going to recognize that, like, they're merely thoughts. Th- my thoughts are not who I am. And, like, I'm going to stop thinking about this eventually. So I'm just going to stop thinking about the fact that I'm thinking about it and, and like, stop trying to actively engage with these thoughts. Which means you have to stop fighting them. Which, um, a good analogy for this is, like, if someone tells you to stop thinking about a red square... All you're going to be thinking about is a red square. Like, oh, stop thinking about it. But I can't. Um, okay, the fourth thing. You must have an opinion on everything. I know people in my life who, like, feel obligated to have an opinion about literally everything. Almost like it's a moral duty of theirs. And so they're constantly pursue- perceiving their experiences through the filter of, like, what conclusions am I drawing about this? What is my opinion? Is this good or bad? One of my friends, she is like the most unjudgmental person I know. And I think it's because she's like in this habit of just kind of accepting the way life is and not like, it's not so much stop questioning life as much as just stop looking at life through the filter of is this good or bad? Or like, what do I think about it? Like feeling like you need to do that. Yeah, that filter is useful and necessary in some cases. But you don't have to go through every single hour of your day Mm -hmm. engaging with everything through that filter. Like, there's a lot of things you should just experience rather than having takes on. Which I wonder why we feel the need to have takes on everything. And then, um, you can't control your thoughts in the way you thought you could. But, like, it is possible to stop thinking, just not in the way you thought. So there's the Bible verse, Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, or praiseworthy, think about such things. So the Bible is telling you 
to think about things, mm-hmm. meaning it expects you to be able to control your thought to some extent. Mm-hmm. But we can't really control our thoughts because when we try, we just start thinking more about the red square, basically. Yeah. So it's more like you have to shift your attention rather than change your thoughts. Yeah. So, like, just kind of like, I don't know, if you're thinking about, I don't know, everything that's wrong with the world or something, just mm-hmm. something. You're you're focusing on those things, and you need to, like, realize that you're focusing on those things, and then, like, kind of, like, turn your head, as it were, and be like, actually, there's roses over here, and I'm going to, like, focus on the roses, and then wherever your attention is, that's what your thoughts are more going to be. And you Mm -hmm. might, like, your attention might keep getting drawn back to everything that's wrong with the world, but you can draw it back to the roses. So you might have to... You might have to make a practice of doing that, but you can change your attention. You can change the focus of your attention, which changes your thoughts. And that's basically how you control your thoughts in a practical way. And I feel like the key to that is not being bothered by the fact that your thoughts keep going back to the red square. Just being like, oh, that red happened. Square. <laughs> yeah, like not getting upset about it. Just being like, yeah, the, this is the way things are, but that's okay. Like, But also not giving up. What was your analogy about... The habit you had that you were trying to change and you were feeling, you realized what you were thinking was, you've tried to change this habit before and it didn't Mm -hmm. work. Why not just accept that this is how you are and not do anything? So obviously you can't just accept that you're going to be perpetually fixated on a red square. Mm -hmm. You just have to persistently change your attention every time and not get like frustrated with yourself for having to do that. Yeah. Just keep doing it. And it actually works. Like, and it gets easier over time Mm -hmm. the more you do it just like any other skill but which actually yeah I actually feel like that's kind of a skill that I just learned when I was a kid and that's maybe part of why I don't have problems with yeah and you're also really good at like staying in the moment again something that I think I trained myself to do as a kid well this explains why you're intelligent because you were like smart as a kid and like (laughs) whatever (laughs) figured out life (laughs) okay so here's a quote When we're deeply engaged in a sport of creative activity, the one who's doing it disappears. The thoughts about what's happening fade away. Life becomes something we're inside of rather than something a separate I is making happen. So even though technically you're not completely devoid of thought as you're engaging in these activities because you have to be literally thinking to engage with them, it's like you're not thinking about the fact that you're the one doing it or just about life in general, I feel like. Which is kind of the definition of stopping thinking. Do you feel like part of the problem with people nowadays being unable to stop thinking is simply that their attention spans are so fractured by modern technology and the way the world works now that it's really hard for them to actually get sunk in something without being distracted away by something else? Like their their ability to focus is impaired? Yeah, I think it's an element of it for sure not to be like a homeschool mom but phones probably contribute because <laughs> I, I can you... i can tell you from my own experience that they yeah. do. like i try not to be on my phone very much because i didn't get a phone till i was 17 and so i wasn't i mean i was good at focusing mm-hmm. and i was still fine at focusing for a while after having my phone and i eventually got more like started to use it more and more no i wasn't like addicted to it but i don't know i i when you've been using your phone a lot for a while and get and you've gotten into the habit of if you're doing something and you hit any kind of snag, you just, like, pop over to your phone, mm-hmm. do something for a little, then come back and try and get past the snag. And then if you hit another snag, you're like, oh, it's like the go-to because it's the easiest thing your mind can engage with. Yeah. And so doing that for a while, I kind of, I don't know, it started to mess with my ability to focus long term. Mm-hmm. And I realized that and made an effort to only be on my phone for certain amounts of time and to not have my phone with me when I was working on something that I needed to focus on and stuff. And so I'm much better with it now. My attention span is still not as good as it used to be. And I think that also has to do with college and the fact that not to rant about this, but like they put everything online and then they put, but then they also have this extra thing you have to do over here. And then they have it on like two different websites, plus your email that you have to check to see when they send your assignments there. And you have this for like seven different classes. Mm -hmm. And then you have to turn this in through here, but this assignment, you can't even see what it is unless you go here. And then you have to turn that in here. 
And it's just a mess. And so your brain is trying to keep track of seven different classes, three different places that you have to look in things, and like five different places with, which within each of those three different places. And so your mind is just like bouncing back and forth between all the things you have to remember to do all the time, every hour of every day, until you have all your assignments turned in, which never happens until the end of the semester. And so your attention span is just shot by the end of the semester. Yeah. And so I feel like I am back to being a little more able to focus on things long term. But that also contributed to it. So it's not even that people are addicted to their phones completely. It's also that the way modern life is set up a lot of times, your attention span just gets fractured because people set up things poorly. Well, yeah. And also I think when kids have phones from a younger age, their brains are formed by that interaction so that it may never be possible for them to have as good of an attention span. Well, I wouldn't say it's never possible. It's just that that's what's normal to their brain. And that's how, like, they've gotten so good at it that it's like, why be any different? Because that's the world you live in. You know, you've adapted to they've the They've gotten so good of, at what? Both like, multitasking in the worst way possible. Yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying is, if you if you don't grow up and your brain isn't formed in the habit of focusing on things for long periods of time, it's going to be harder for you as an adult to develop that ability. I would agree with than that. Than to just recapture that ability like I have to. Like just losing the ability to be bored is very tragic. Because one, and, and I had a very similar experience to you. Once I got my phone, whenever there was like a moment of silence or a moment I wasn't doing anything, I would get on my phone. And when, whenever I didn't have my phone, it was like withdrawals of an addiction basically because it would be like, I would have this sense of like, Oh, like the the boringness would be painful. Mm -hmm. Whereas before the boringness was just like my brain was able to just go into that phase of kind of like restfulness. But after I had my phone, it was like, well, I'm just, I felt like unproductive. But at the same time, it's not like I would have been productive on my phone. It's just like, now my brain can't be entertained at this very exact moment. <laughs> yeah. And there's also like research been done on the brain about how if you spend a prolonged amount of time doing something, it's like your brain needs, it needs a moment to get into that activity. But once it's like deep in it, you can get stuff done a lot more efficiently, a lot better, a lot more, like you think of more ideas or you just, you're, it's better quality. Yeah. And, and quantity when you spend time doing something and you're not distracted by these other things going on. But, so you do, you do more effective work when you're not multitasking. Right. You would like get more done if you just say you're multitasking at two things and you split it mm -hmm. up and you did this for three hours and then this for three hours. Mm -hmm. You would get more done on both in that six hour span than if you just did both for the whole six hours. Mm -hmm. But if your brain has adapted to this world in which you're always having distractions, it's like even when you technically have the ability to spend that much time doing something, your brain will still just be like, oh, I, but okay, I spent 10 minutes doing this. Now I need to go do something else really quick. Okay, now I do. And it's like your brain is hardwired to now initiate these signals that were once outside of it. And I also think that the concept of having a phone constantly on you is also really problematic just because you have your email, you have all these things that are technically like responsible that you could be attending to. So any moment of silence in your life you could technically be doing something that would be benefiting you, but it's not beneficial because you need the ability to just stop. Like, say you're not at home right now and you can't do your assignment on your computer, but technically you could do it on your phone. It's like, but it's better to just wait till you go home. and But it makes you feel ir irresponsible to not do it. It's just like this whole conundrum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's basically um, what... C.S. Lewis was talking about mm -hmm. last week's episode in membership mm -hmm. where everyone is just like constantly plugged into this and there's no like solitude. There's no one-on-one -on -one. everything. There's always a bunch of things distracting for your attention and a bunch of things you should be doing. And it's almost viewed as irresponsible for you to take time for yourself. But actually that's what keeps you healthy. Basically what C.S. Lewis was deploring in that essay is what our world is now, like, times a thousand. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Now, that, I, I genuinely, like, often don't take my phone with me places so that I can't be tempted or feel bad for not. All right, favorite quotes. Holly, what's yours? Okay. My favorite quote is, it's kind of more like a favorite paragraph. <laughs> 
It's often the case that our repetitive thought loops, particularly of the life and death sort, are trying to preserve or support a certain self-image or identity. The belief is this, if we can get the other person to perceive us in the way we want to be perceived, see us as the person we want to be seen as, then, and only then, we will get to experience ourselves as that kind of person. We'll get to be that person. We can't stop thinking about how we're going to correct or, or control the other person's perception of us because our own identity depends on it. Which so applies to me. <laughs> like, I need this person to think that I'm a respectable person in order to feel like I'm a respectable person. It's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, weren't you just saying last week how um, God's perception is the only one that's <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> i'm gonna start banging the table again <laughs> so okay i have a favorite quote and a favorite part i'm okay so my favorite quote i'm gonna try and quote this verbatim and imagine it said in a complete robot voice and then you'll get the full effect place a hand on your heart and your other hand on your abdomen if you feel comfortable and show yourself the kindness that you need in this moment Give yourself the compassion for what you are going through. You know how many times they repeated that throughout the book? <laughs> because it was more than five. <laughs> she says with a grimace and snarl on her face. Well, of course you'd be making fun of this book. You didn't really read it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. The thing is, I hate audiobooks, but I'm still not snob enough to say that they're not real books. <laughs> well, it's not. It's, it's listening. It's not reading. It's a different thing. It doesn't count. So when I read Kidnapped and Peter Pan and The Prince and the Pauper to my little sister, she didn't read it. Okay, actually, so I'm not a complete snob because I do think that, like, especially, like, autobiographies or some forms of fiction, like, it totally does count that if you listen to it, you did, like, read it in quotes because it's just, like, the okay, same. Quotes. Yeah, it is the same. You're, like, taking in the book. Yeah, you're taking in the same information and you're grabbing the same things from it you would be if you were physically reading it. But other things this book included. This book included? Yes. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I would go for, like, picture books, obviously. Well, well, there, like, there's studies done on what your eyes do when you're reading. And, like, we often reread subconsciously without knowing or we'll just take pauses and we're not even aware of it to think about stuff or draw connections. And you can't do that if you're listening well, to it. Well, that's part of why I don't like audiobooks is because I can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's part of what makes reading reading. So that's why listening to it doesn't count, first off. That is not part of what makes reading reading. That is one of the perks of reading. Well, and also eyes. when you're listening to something, your mind sometimes drifts off. Yeah, well, my mind sometimes drips off when I'm reading. I did that a lot with my chemistry textbook. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree with that, but that's the perk of reading is, like, you your eyes may still be running over the words, but then you realize once you come to, oh, I didn't actually read that, and so you actually read it. But with listening, sometimes you, can you didn't just even... rewind. I'm right. But, like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm right. <laughs> But you don't sometimes because you're driving and it's unsafe. Well, that's or true. someone's reading it to you and that you don't want to be happen. like, stop! Huh. Funny how um, little sister didn't have that qualm. <laughs> <laughs> Random facts. So, 80% of our thoughts are negative, And I've heard that outside of this book as well. And I don't know how one measures that or how many people they measure that with. So, you know, it that could be very inaccurate. Uh, okay, so... You know what? Sue me that I don't know how to pronounce this. Whatever. Calibacter crescentus, a bacterium that lives in water, holds the title for the stickiest substance on Earth. It secretes a sugary compound three times stronger than superglue. A tiny bit of it can withstand the pull of lifting several cars at once. Have you heard of this before? No, I have not heard of it. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Uh, the author of this book, in addition to being a psychotherapist, she's also what's called an interfaith minister, which I looked up because I was like, what the heck is that? <laughs> and according to the Google, it said that basically you help people figure out what they believe or assist them in identifying their own spiritual beliefs, which is like, how would you ever execute a job like that and not have any sort of bias? Like, Okay, yeah, it sounds like you belong in the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> so here's how you can get plugged into your community. 
if you have any beliefs at all as a person, you're going to have a bias towards helping people figure out what they believe and sort of try to impact that. Yeah, which is better technically because if some worldviews are better than others. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So that career field doesn't really make sense to me. (laughs) Did you have one more random fact? According to some psychologists at Harvard, we are lost in thought almost 50% of the time. Which, again, how would you measure that? But also, I also feel like... Probably you just, like, wave your hand in front of their face. Oh, they're not responding. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so as far as the book itself, I thought... I I think the lady was, like, really smart, and she said a lot of things that are kind of revolutionary. Like, I haven't heard any other self-help book bring them up. And I also appreciated... She went into how... She went into why other self-help books aren't helpful, which I also found very relatable. Um, I, I don't read that many self-help books, but whenever I do, it's like, okay, this is a book for someone in a very specific situation or in a very specific specific season, and if you don't fall into whatever category, it's, like, unhelpful for you. Or maybe, like, it said something that you already know and would have been helpful mm-hmm. if you had that, and so it's just you don't know quite what you're going to get. Uh, I also thought it was, like, very realistic about how the mind is. Uh, she was also able to word things pretty well, which is funny because she would always, it was like she kind of published the rough draft and she should have like gone through, she would say something and then reword it and then reword it again. And it's like every time she reworded it, the message got a little clearer and she was saying it a little more precisely and better, but she just chose to keep all of the rewording. (laughs) And it's like, maybe you should have like just kept the last thing you said when you said the same thing four times in a row. (laughs) So it was pretty repetitive. And I appreciate that the book isn't that long, but I think it would have been even better if she had cut it down more. And yeah. Thank you for listening to the third episode of the Two Retired Homeschoolers podcast. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. You can also follow us on Instagram to be notified each time we upload a new episode at Two Retired Homeschoolers. Just a reminder, please rate and review or comment and like. You can also email us at tworetiredhomeschoolers at gmail.com. Next week, we will be reviewing Assignment in Brittany by Helen McInnes. And stay tuned for bloopers if you like. me a homeschooler. Why is Emily calling me? I have to say, next time you're sad, I'm just gonna be like, remember that you're a human being. Put your hand (laughs) over your heart and and repeat after me. I deserve compassion. (laughs)